Hi, glad you could join us today and uh, welcome to this our latest live event presented by the IET Sorry. Surrey. And uh, if you're new to the IET, you may not know that we are the largest professional body of engineers in Europe. And overall, there are about 160,000 members of the IET working, in fact, not just Europe, the UK, but across the whole world. And our organisation is 150 years old. We celebrated that milestone last year. And today the, uh, the event is brought to you by the volunteers in uh, the south of England in the local area of Surrey. So uh, it's great that you can join us and today's topic is about photography and uh, what could be more topical if you think that um, photography is everywhere these days and the demand for high quality photography has never been greater uh, throughout history. Now, part of that, of course, is because the technology of digital cameras is much more accessible than um, it, it ever was with uh, film cameras, uh, accessible and affordable. But of course, the skill is uh, still required to make good uh, photographs. And we're very lucky today that we've got Neil Freeman from the Nikon School, who's going to tell us something about that. So the rise of digital photography since the beginning of the 21st century has moved the camera technology on, uh, optomechanics having been replaced with electronics. And today we're aiming to provide a good grounding in photography to understand the different types of cameras such as uh, DSLR or mirrorless, uh, their different modes of operation such as uh, auto, uh, manual with aperture or shutter priority modes and so on to help you understand how to take great pictures. Uh, now don't worry if any of those terms that I just mentioned are unfamiliar to you. Uh, we're going to describe the technology in a digital camera uh, using the lenses, the sensors, uh, the clever image processing units and also the memory card. So we're going to cover all those things today. Now this is our December 21 um, event and it's primarily intended for younger people. As a, a body of engineers, we want to encourage the next generation of engineers to come forward and to have an interest in a technology, in technology as a career. So if you happen to be a little older, perhaps like me, then uh, maybe you're a parent or a grandparent, please make it your mission to tell someone who's younger than you to watch this on Catch Up via YouTube and that will be available in a few days. Now, our guest today is uh, Neil Freeman, and his passion for photography actually began as a child uh, when he got the chance to use his dad's uh, SLR camera. And so we're going to hope that uh, his passion is going to spread on to the younger generation as well, and others will be similarly inspired. As a self-confessed technology buff, Neil has built up an impressive bank of knowledge over the whole range of camera brands, uh, imaging software, and of course, all things that are Nikon, uh, where he's the training manager at their Nikon school. And he's photographed everything from high-end weddings and portraits to landscapes in low light, uh, product photography, and so on. He ran his own professional photography business for a decade before joining Nikon in 2013 to become the Nikon school training manager. The last 18 months have been amongst the most exhilarating in Neil's career, he says. Uh, from falling in love with the, the new uh, mirrorless Z series cameras to switching his courses from central London to the online world where we are all today. So let's now throw the focus of our lens towards Neil and hear how technology allows today's photographers to perfect their art form to live and breathe life through a lens. Very much, Nigel, uh, for that very nice uh, uh, introduction. Uh, welcome, everybody. Great to see you all here. Uh, I hope uh, the next hour or so is going to be uh, interesting for you. Uh, please do ask questions. We're going to have a time for a Q&A at the end. Um, so if there's anything I say or anything I go through that you don't quite get, uh, there is no such thing as a silly question this evening. Please do ask questions. Um, and I'm just going to get right underway here. That's, that's Cheers, Nigel. Um, 
if you want to follow along, if you want to look at some of these images, some of them are, if you're on Instagram, that's the main platform I use, uh, Nick on School UK, or my work channel there, Nick on Neil UK. A lot of the images I'm going to talk about are actually on that channel. And if you've got any questions to follow up with as well, you could DM me there if you wanted to. But let's talk about photography. Photography has moved on a lot since I first picked the camera up in the 80s when my dad first gave me, uh, well, first got a chance to play my dad's camera. Um, I've been shooting a lot. I'm very passionate about photography, inspired by the likes of Ansel Adams, uh, George Hurrell, who shot the 1920s, 1930s, sort of black and white Hollywood style portraiture. Uh, photography's come on a long way. Technology helps us now. We're into the realms of computational AI photography, and lots of great engineering um, systems go into the cameras as well now to help us as photographers make our life a lot easier. I'm going to try and um, this evening go through some of that and demystify what historically has probably been uh, quite a complex subject, uh, which has put a lot of people off. Photography isn't difficult, okay? Photography is actually really easy. Hopefully this evening I'm going to demystify that for you. So what do we look at? Different types of camera. We've gone from analog film cameras Yes, I'm old enough to have shot those. DSLRs, digital single lens reflex. So we have the mirror movement that moves up and down inside the camera to create, help us create that image. And the more modern interpretation of that are mirrorless cameras. Now from film to DSLR um, to mirrorless, this isn't really sort of a, a revolution in photography. It's more evolution of the same thing. Light is still important. And I'll talk about that later. But whether you're shooting with a film camera, a DSLR, so a digital SLR or a mirrorless camera, we are still taking the same approach to photography. And this is true if you're using your phone or your tablet as well. Fundamentally, these are devices that manage light. The reason why we use a mirrorless or a DSLR is it gives us the maximum flexibility to manage the light in front of us so we can actually create some really interesting images. Phones and tablets are great, they have their place, but if you really wanna take com command and take control of the light in front of you to create some really outstanding pictures, you've got to have a, a device that allows you to control that light. So how do we go about looking at that light and recording that light that's in front of us? Well, the first thing that everybody knows about are megapixels. How many millions of pixels does our camera have? Now, we all think, and the industry's told us, and we're partly to blame for that, and so, so are the other camera brands, that megapixels are everything. Actually, they're not. Megapixels are only half the story. How many millions of pixels of sensor, uh, how many millions of pixels you have on your sensor is only about how much information you can record. It has nothing to do with the quality of your picture. Okay, your quality of your picture comes from the lenses in front of those megapixels. The way your autofocus system works, how it tracks, whether it's got eye detect, face detect, or whether you're pushing it onto a particular subject, that has a big part to play in how much of your, your image is going to be sharp. Whether you've got the camera on burst rate or whether or not you're shooting video, our latest camera can shoot at 120 frames a second, 45 megapixel images at 120 frames a second. So that's an incredible amount of data and you can pull a still from that if you want. The dynamic range of the sensor you have, how much it can see, how much information it can record from zero to 255, or in computer terms, there's RGB, red, green, blue, zero is pure black, 255 is pure white. And in between, we have all the tonalities, the, the grayscale tonalities. How good is your sensor at recording the dynamic range of the scene? So how much of the scene can it actually see? And then we've got what's called ISO performance. How good is it in low light? How can we actually achieve good low light pictures? All of this comes together as part of the technology package that makes your camera perform well in a given situation. So let's have a look at the sensor tech. There are various different sizes of sensors. You have your phone sensor. Roughly your phone sensor is about the size of your thumbnail. 
The next sensor size up is called Micro Four Thirds, which is used by some other brands. And then we have something called APS-C, also known as DX. That's a smaller size sensor that's one and a half times smaller than a 35 mil negative film. We then have something called FX or full frame. So called because it is the same size roughly as a 35 mil negative from an old film camera. So it's called full frame. Now you get the best resolution and the best dynamic range, the best ISO performance from the bigger the sensor you have because the pixels can be bigger on that sensor. Hence they can handle low light situations better and they can handle sort of dynamic range better. They can also, the photo sites on the pixels on the sensor itself, they can capture more light. There are two types of main sensors that, that are in the market. You've got CCD and you have CMOS. For most consumer grade cameras these days, CMOS is it. Uh, CCD is used in very, very specialist applications like uh, very small astrophotography cameras and things like that. But the mainstay of the camera industry now is CMOS based chips. And you get different types of CMOS chips. So your phone or your tablet, for example, will have a standard CMOS sensor in it. You then get a BSI CMOS sensor, which stands for Backside Illuminated Sensors. What's so good about Backside Illuminated Sensors? They give you the ability to have high megapixel sensors and still perform really well in low light. Standard CMOS sensors, you can either have high megapixel sensors, and they don't perform very well in low light, or you have low megapixel sensors that perform well in low light. A BSI sensor gives you the best of both worlds. And again, this technology, this is only about four or five years old. So technology is moving very, very quickly at a sensor level. The newest type of sensors are stacked sensors. Stacked sensors give you the ability to increase the readout speed of the sensor. What does that mean in the real world? It means we can get data off the sensor much, much quicker, and we can get that to our memory cards much quicker, as long as we've got fast enough memory cards. So with a stacked CMOS sensor, the readout speeds become very, very fast. That means our autofocus gets quicker, so we can track more moving objects, bigger moving objects, more, com more complex computational AI calculations can be done as well. And the state of the art is backside illuminated stacked CMOS sensors. So we've got fast readout speeds, we can have high megapixels, plus we can get that really good low light performance. So we have a range of CMOS uh, technology there. And I said, some of this is now only in the last four years has it moved forward and it's moving forward very, very quickly. So over the next few years, you're going to see a lot of BSI stacked CMOS sensors and that will start to trickle down into things like phones and tablets as well um, once they've sort of become mainstream in the cameras. Now, cameras are also made for other things. You see the shell there. These are magnesium. Our cameras are magnesium alloy built, so they're tough. Uh, single shell there, so it's monocoque chassis design. Um, and that makes it very, very tough and very easy to weather seal. So we can actually put these very delicate electronic components inside them. And I mentioned there about, it's not just about the sensor, it's about the lens tech as well. That upper image there you can see there, that's a 1970s 2000 mil F11 lens, okay? Still fits on our cameras if we wanted to. Uh, that was pre-drone, pre-satellite, they used to mount that on destroyers and helicopters to be out sea over the horizon. It takes two people to lift it. It is enormous. If you look there, my colleague's actually holding up uh, a two-year-old camera that does the same thing, okay, in focal length wise. So you can see as technology moves forward. For lens tech, the bayonet, bayonet mount size, how big is the bayonet mount? How much light can we get into the camera? The bigger the bayonet mount size, the less we have to bend light to get it onto the sensor. And that means we can get sharper images, okay? The coatings that you have on your lens also enable you or not to be able to shoot directly into the sun, get less lens flare, more lens flare, depends on what you want. They also make the lenses drip resistant um, and dust resistant as well. You can have things these days like twin autofocus motors, which make the lenses lightning fast when they're focusing. And again, the optical quality of the glass that goes into the 
into the lenses. We are an optics company. That is what we did. We, were, we made optics before we made cameras. So as an optical company, our glass that we use in our lenses is, it's all hand finished still. Um, so we get very, very high quality optics in our lenses arrayed in certain elements so we can get really, really good performance from our lenses. And of course, they're all weather sealed to stop dust and, and sort of uh, water and anything that's in the elements getting inside the lenses because that will compromise performance. So let's talk about resolution. Uh, this is one of the biggest misunderstood things about photography. Sensor resolution, take for example, 45 megapixels. That is the number of millions of pixels on your sensor. Now you could relate that in file size, i.e. 45 megapixels roughly gives you 100 megabit files on your computer or your tablet. You could talk to somebody about the pixel dimensions of that sensor, 8,256 by 5,504 pixels. If you talked about that, you've probably not got many friends or you won't have a very long lasting conversation. Uh, most people talk about megapixels. Why is this important? Display technology is way behind the technology on, that we can actually capture on our sensors. So we can capture at 45 megapixels. Some sensors go beyond that as well. But let's talk about display tech. 4K displays, so that's 3,840 pixels by 2,160 pixels. That's 8K, 8 megapixels, okay? So a 4K display is 8 megapixels. Doesn't matter how big your screen is, it's still only showing eight megapixels, okay? So what this enables us to do with our sensors technology we have in our cameras is we can crop into our pictures a long, long way. We can throw away a lot of our information and it still look amazing on state-of-the-art cameras, or state-of-the-art screens. If you look at an 8K display, an 8K display is about 33 megapixels. Now that's starting to get interesting. That comes with other problems in that bandwidth to um, display that amount of information has to be very, very fast as well. Those of us that still have full HD screens, if you've got one there, a 1080p full HD screen. 1080 is 1080, 1080 times 1920, two megapixels, okay? So if you've got a full HD screen, you're only actually displaying two megapixels worth of information. So don't be afraid when you're shooting with your camera, whether it's your phone, your tablet, or your um, mirrorless camera, or your SLR, DSLR, um, to crop into your pictures, because display technology is way behind where we are. Roughly, for example, printing, it's about 14 megapixels. Depends on the uh, DPI you print at, but most prints are done at about 14 megapixels. So it's worth remembering this, that display technology is way behind what we can capture on our sensors. Just to give you an example here, here's our old studio room. We crop into that, we throw away 99% of the image. You can see we blow it back up at 12 megapixels. It's the clock face is out of focus. We do that at 36 megapixels. We see that the clock face suddenly becomes sharper, okay? 45 megapixels, we can do this. We can shoot an image like that and I can crop in and make pictures within pictures. This also means I don't necessarily need to have huge lenses. So if you've got big sensors or sensors that capture a large amount of megapixels and you've got good lenses in front of those that enable you to capture sharp images, you can do things like this. So once we've captured that data, we need to turn it into a software so that so, so our computers, so we can edit and finish our pictures. There are two main types of file format to record that digital information that we've captured. We've got JPEG and we've got RAW, okay? JPEG stands for Joint Photographic Experts Group. It was invented in the 90s uh, because file sizes were enormous and Card sizes were small. My first card that I ever bought was four gigabytes. It was 328 quid. And that was in 2003. Um, yeah, you can't even buy four gigabyte cards anymore. Um, JPEG, it's universal. Everything reads it, everything understands it. It's very easy to share because it is a compressed file format. It's a lossy file format. What does that mean? That means that every time you save a JPEG, it gets compressed. It throws away data. To give you an idea, 
the difference between the highest quality JPEG file you can get out of any camera device, whether that's your phone, tablet, or your mirrorless camera, and the RAW file, the JPEG is 75% smaller than the RAW file. That's how much data it's lost, okay? So JPEG is great for sharing quickly, but it is not going to give you high quality images. Raw files, on the other hand, you think about as the digital negative. You can create JPEGs or TIFFs or PNGs from raw files, but you can't create a, from a JPEG, you can't create a raw file. So raw is the highest quality you can ever use. It is proprietary. Every manufacturer has their own. So I've shot Canon before. They have CR3, Camera Raw 3. We have .NEF, Nikon Electronic File. Each manufacturer has their own. Things like Lightroom, Capture One, Photoshop can read all of them. But a raw file is the highest possible data capture. Uh, and that's what you can get, especially a 14-bit raw file. Lots of color depth, okay? Lots of information on it. And you can go back from, to your raw file time and time again, and it is non-destructive editing when you're doing your editing. So if you've got chance or if your device shoots raw, you should shoot raw. OK, the thing with RAW, the downside to RAW is you can't share it until you've created a JPEG or a TIFF file from it. And this is where we move into the world of computational AI. So your phone or your tablet, um, you shoot the image, it suddenly shows you a picture. It's done a lot of computational on there, computational AI based on the software algorithms built into your phone. It processes the data and it then applies color tones, filters, et cetera, et cetera. Does a bit with the sharpness, contrast maybe, and things like that to give you a JPEG that you see on your screen immediately. It does this very, very quickly. And it will give you an okay result, okay? We can then further apply filters to that if we want to do anything like that as well. However, as good as computational AI software is these days on our phones and our tablets, it doesn't, and our cameras, it doesn't necessarily get the colors spot on. So the raw edited file here, which I actually edited later uh, that evening when I got back to, after running the workshop here, um, the raw edit, if you look there between the reds and the blues and the greens, it's got much more color definition and it. it's correct colors, okay? But if you looked at the JPEG, you'd be happy with that until you put it next to the raw file, okay? So computational AI photography is getting good, but it's still, if you finish your picture and you edit your pictures afterwards, there is still room to work with your raw files and still get a better image and better colors from your raw files. So let's talk about shooting modes. How do we actually shoot? We've got lots of options. We've got auto, we've got P for program, shutter priority, S, aperture priority, A, manual mode. We've got effects modes, we've got scene modes. They're all preset modes. Now, there's nothing wrong with the automatic modes. They'll get you a shot, okay? You won't have the maximum control over that shot. So when I say the maximum control, you've not got maximum control over the light. You've not got maximum control over the color. Um, so we recommend if you really want to get the best possible images, you need to be able to control your shutter speed and your aperture and your ISO. And that's why we would shoot in generally manual mode, aperture priority, or shutter priority. Let's have a look at those now. So to control the light, in any given situation, you have a set amount of light coming in. We have to balance that to get our exposure. Our exposure is our image. How do we balance that? We use shutter speed, that lets more or less light in. We could use ISO, that lets more or less light in. Or we could use aperture, and that lets more or less light in. But each one of those corners of the, this is called the exposure triangle, each one of those corners, that gives us a creative effect. If we alter the shutter speed to let light in, we also alter the motion in our image. If we alter the ISO to let more or less light in, we alter the quality of our image. And if we alter the aperture, we change the area of sharpness in the image. So while we are letting more or less light in by changing any of these, we are also changing the creative look of our picture, okay? It's all about balancing. So semi-automatic modes on your camera, on your phone, on your tablet, do all this automatically for you, okay? 
they do the balancing act for you if we were shoot in manual mode we bring that we bring that skill of balancing the light and that enables us to take great pictures so if we control motion we use shutter priority s on our camera so we control the motion the camera is dealing with the quality and the area of sharpness the aperture okay why would we want to use shutter shutter speed well if you look here different speeds so the one on the right here 200th of a second so it's a split moment in time okay we get all the water droplets as it comes down the cascade if we change our shutter speed to four seconds okay our camera records the reflected light off the water onto the sensor over that four second period and over that four second period you can see how far the light has actually how far the water's moved because the light has reflected back into the sensor so we get the water trails or we get car trails headlight trails brake light trails okay so that's four seconds there. that's called a long exposure or a slow shutter speed we're using 200th of a second on the right hand side there that's called a fast shutter speed okay or a high shutter speed so depending on which shutter speed you choose depends on the type of image you're going to get none of these are right none of these are wrong what type of picture what motion do you want in your image generally the rule of thumb faster something's moving the faster shutter speed we need to freeze it red arrows are pretty quick four thousandth of a second to freeze them birds in flight two thousandth of a second dancers eight hundredth of a second people walking along the street one one twenty fifth my dog running one two thousand and fiftieth of a second if i want everything sharp now i could use other speeds shutter speeds to deliberately create uh, motion in the picture say i shot the red arrows at uh, one one thousandth they're going to have a little bit of blur on them that could be a creative choice i make to do that similarly with the bird coming into land there i could blur the wings if i shot that at a slower shutter speed okay but making those creative choices is something you do after you've mastered the actual basics of can i get a sharp picture can i get it in focus if we want to go to slower shutter speeds here we can do all sorts of creative stuff we can do two minute exposures here and make the wheel look like it's spinning really really fast we can do longer exposures of water and we can make the bus disappear there down um coming along the road there so it's a bus going through we don't see the outside of the bus because that it's moving too fast to reflect the light off of it but the lights inside it get recorded on the camera very very quickly because the sensor is sensitive to light so we can do all sorts of clever things if we know what we're doing with it so shutter speed controls the motion in your picture image sharpness image sharpness is to do with your aperture and where you're focusing so if we put the camera into aperture priority a on our cameras it's tv on some other camera oh, sorry tv is shutter speed on some other cameras av on some other cameras um aperture what we have here is the camera controls the motion and the quality we control the depth of field so depth of field what is it if i put my focus point on this plant for example and i shoot at a low f number i.e f 1.4 we get very little in focus the easy way to remember this low numbers very little in focus f 16 however it's a bigger number if i keep my focus point where it is i get more in focus it's as easy as that big f numbers mean more in focus small f numbers mean very little in focus that's the easiest way of remembering aperture these days sort of on your phones and things like that because of the and the the aperture is controlled by the lens you're using this is why i came back to at the beginning the lens you have is important blurring backgrounds like that they're doing that with software now on phones on the image as part of the computational ai process that the the image goes through as you ask after you've shot it it still doesn't look as good as if you shoot it with a lens with the aperture a small f number because it just um, the edges around the subject just doesn't look right if you actually compare them side by side but small f numbers like that f1.4 we actually make a lens that goes down to f 0.95 and that is millimeters sharp 
uh, it's an amazing out of focus area. Those out of focus areas are called bokeh, B-O-K-E-H. That's the technical term for an intentional out of focus area. So we choose small F numbers to blur backgrounds, big F numbers if we want everything sharp. Here, this is shot at F1.4, focus point on Monique's eye there, and that blurs the street completely, okay? So those are traffic lights, office buildings, cars going, moving down the road behind Monique. But because I've shot at F1.4, everything blurs out and we have this sort of 3D effect. And this is how it would work. So from wherever you focus, you have a third in front of your image and two thirds behind your image. And this is whether you're using a camera, um, an SLR or a mirrorless camera, or whether you're using your phone. This is how depth of field works. Okay, it's one third in front of your subject, two thirds behind your subject. The depth of field gets bigger, the bigger the F number you use. If we want everything sharp, we'll use bigger numbers. So this terminal moraine here at the glacier, we'll use F11. I've included the people there to uh, give you an idea of the scale of this thing. It's enormous. Um, it's probably about half a mile front to back there. Um, and I can get that all sharp by using F11. It's the same principle, one third in front of my focus point, two thirds behind my focus point. But because I'm using a larger F number, everything is sharp. However, we do need to bear in mind something called airy disks. Now, airy disks are create blur on your image. Back in the day when I used to shoot film cameras, film is a very soft medium, okay? You don't notice airy disks. You don't notice how soft it actually is and the way that the light comes into the lens. Digital sensors, on the other hand, are utterly unforgiving, especially if you're shooting high megapixel ones, okay? 36 megapixels, 45 megapixels, okay? So the higher the F number you do, or you shoot at, the bigger the airy disc is that comes through the lens. You don't want big airy discs because they'll make your image soft. So there is a sweet spot, and that tends to be around F8 to F11. If you're focusing correctly, that will give you front to back sharpness in your shots, okay? And we avoid blur created by airy discs. Now, this is back in the day um, from film photography. There are still a lot of film photographers, old school photographers that haven't caught up with new, new style uh, cameras and things like that. So they're still shooting their digital cameras at F22 and getting soft images. That again, is one of the things we do at Nikon School is educate people about this a lot because a lot of people think their focusing is wrong, but in actual fact, they're using the wrong F number. Photography evolves as technology evolves, and we have to change our photo uh, photography techniques alongside that. Let's talk about ISO, the third corner of the triangle. ISO, this used to be our old film speed when we used to load film into our cameras, okay? Um, we'd choose a film, we'd load it in our cameras, we'd shoot 36 rolls of it, and then we'd take the film out and load a new film, and away we'd go. I used to shoot weddings with three different camera bodies, or film camera bodies. One would have ISO 400, which is, or sorry, ASA 400, which is the standard for sort of UK light. Then one would have 1600, which is the church inside and dark inside the reception area. And then one would have 160, which would be bright outside. And I had to remember, you had to take the back of the, the, the film carton to the camera to remember which uh, film you put in which camera. Um, I don't miss those days at all. The easiest way to remember ISO is the lower the number, the higher quality you get, okay? The higher the number, the lower quality you get. From an engineering perspective, what is actually happening, if you have the sensor, the electrical signals going across the sensor are being amplified, um, in, is, is the easiest way to explain this. So we've got our camera sensor. As we raise our ISO, the signal is amplified on the sensor. If you amplify a signal, you increase the signal to noise ratio, and therefore you get distortion, which is called noise. Um, easiest way of sort of thinking about this, if you're into audio, um, if you've got your sort of amplifier at four or five, um, you can hear all of the instruments and it's very clean. That's what a low ISO gives you. You turn your amp up to 11, 
and you're up at high ISOs, you're gonna get distortion in it. And that's what digital noise is. It's an amplification of the signal to noise ratio. So wherever possible, we try and shoot at low ISOs. However, there are some situations, certainly low light situations, whereby we have to shoot at the higher ISOs. We can remove noise in post-processing to a certain degree, okay? But we'll never eliminate it um, sort of entirely. Now, going back to the sensor technology that your, your sensor's built from, depends on how good a noise profile your particular camera has, because cameras are engineered to shoot at an optimum ISO. The camera I shoot with is, is designed to shoot at ISO 64 to give me very clean images. I have two camera bodies, actually. The other camera body I have is optimized to shoot at high ISOs, so I cover best of both worlds, okay? But they're different. I've got a 45 megapixel camera to shoot at ISO 64, and then I have a 24 megapixel camera to shoot at 102,000 ISO if I needed to. So why manual mode? We've discussed aperture priority where you control the depth of field, how much is sharp in your image. We've discussed shutter priority, which is how to control the motion in your image. What happens if you want to control both? Manual mode. Manual mode gives you the ability to control both the shutter speed, so the motion in the image, and the area of sharpness in your image, your aperture, okay? And this is where we get into using things like mirrorless cameras, digital SLRs. This is where your phone starts to fall down or a tablet starts to fall down because we just don't have this control over the lights. Let's talk about lights. Photography is the Greek word light drawing, two words coming together. Light, whether you're using an SLR, a mirrorless, your phone, your tablet, your light will make or break your picture. And you can solve any, um, photography is about solving lighting problems, okay? You can solve and shoot any subject if you ask yourself four questions about light. In any given situation, there is a quantity of light. Look in the room you're in at the moment, okay? Or look out the window. Different quantity of light, probably. How much light is there in the scene? What's the quality of light in the scene? I.e., what are the shadows doing? Are they harsh, deep shadows or are they soft, non-existent shadows? Quality is affected by the light sources you're using. So in this room I'm in at the moment, um, I've got top-down small halogens, okay? Or LEDs now, actually, they're not halogens anymore, so they're uh, energy-efficient LEDs, but they're very small light sources. Small light sources give off hard shadows. Big light sources, give off soft shadows. Let's think about the sun. Is the sun a big or small light source? Well, actually, distance to subject plays a huge part in this. It's 93 million miles away. So therefore, it's a small light source. That gives us hard shadows. So that day we had in July, that was summer, we had hard shadows on the ground if you looked, okay? Cloud cover day, I'm up here in Yorkshire. We get lots of cloudy days up here. Um, flat grey sky today, that acts as a diffusion panel. That makes the sun a large light source because it is coming through the clouds. And then we get no shadows whatsoever. So the quality of light you're shooting with will determine the shadows that you have in your picture. What's the direction of light? Three things to do with the direction of light. Are you shooting with it? So the sun is, say, behind you or the light source is behind you. That means that will illuminate your subject. Are you shooting into it? That will either rim light or give you a silhouette effect. Or are you adding extra light? Are you going to use flash? Are you going to kill the light that's in the scene and add your own light? OK, so direction of light. Three things to do. Shoot with it, shoot into it or kill it. Color. What's the color of light? This is controlled by something called white balance. So the white balance is the Kelvin color scale. So the Kelvin color scale, so it's the temperature of light. Now, depending on the time of day you shoot, depends on the color of light. Daylight at midday is 5,560 Kelvin, okay? If we go down to, on our cameras, it's inverse to how the, the actual Kelvin scale works. But on our cameras, if we go to 3,000 Kelvin, we will cool down the picture so it will look a lot more blue. And if we warm up our Kelvin temperature, it will go orange. Okay, 
So four questions there about light, quantity, quality, direction, and color. Let's talk about color. How's your camera see color? This is a pixel. This is actually what a pixel looks like on your sensor. So you have two green sensors, you have a red sensor, and you have a blue sensor. It's called a Bayer Array Matrix. Your camera makes up all the other colors by using these RGB pixels on the photo sites. Your camera sees the reflected light from the scene. How do we see color? Color is a big input, makes a huge impact in our images, okay? Color wheel theory. I don't know if any of you know color wheel theory. Uh, my wife taught me color wheel theory by saying I can't wear three different colors when I go outside. Uh, actually, it's an uh, interesting uh, concept because it really makes your images work. You have a contrasting colors, so yellow against blue, yellow against purple, so they're opposites, or you have complementary colors, so yellows and greens and oranges. So that this affects the tonality of your image. So if you're interested in color and making your images just work straight out of camera, think about the colors you're using. Have a look at color wheel theory and either use contrasting colors or complementary colors. Composition. If you're stuck, if you're looking at a scene and you're completely stuck, there are some rules to use. One of those is the rule of thirds. Place your subject on the left third or the right third of the frame, okay? You can place the horizon on the lower third or the upper third of the frame. Basically, what the rule of thirds says is don't put your subject in the middle. That's dull, that's boring. So put it on the left third, right third, upper third, lower third. Depends on what shot you've got. Simplify the scene. Here's an exercise for you. If you've got pictures, Put them in front, say, take 10 pictures, put them in front of somebody that wasn't with you when you took them and ask them what they see. It can be quite a depressing uh, um, sort of scenario doing that because I can guarantee unless you've got simple composition, they're going to see stuff that you didn't see. Just because you've taken a picture and you can describe it in a thousand words does not make it a good picture. OK, every picture stands alone. Think about if you go into a gallery or something like that, you look at pictures on the walls. They don't need descriptions generally. You can make it, or it's, if the photographer's done their composition well, you can see immediately what it's about. Avoid the middle, okay? Just don't put stuff in the middle. That's just really, really dull, and everybody does that. Your shooting height, top tip. If you want to make your pictures look immediately better, do not shoot at eye level. Bend down, hold your camera up. Do not shoot at eye level. Everybody shoots at eye level. Everybody puts their subject in the middle. Okay? So you can just change the perspective of the shot just by stand, crouching down or standing up. Don't shoot at eye level. Move yourself as well. Okay? Zoom lenses make people lazy. Okay? They really do. Move your feet. Here's an arrow that's painted on a street. I'm moving around it. I can get all sorts of different compositions, okay? None of these are right, none of these are wrong. Move your feet when you're taking shots, okay? Don't just stand there and use your zoom lens. Use subject movement as part of your composition. If you're shooting moving subjects, we can use moving water, moving clouds. We can make clouds move by using filters. We can pan a shot of bite. We can sort of freeze uh, that hawk coming into sort of land. Use subject movement as a compositional element as well. Use angles, okay? This is a technique called Dutch tilt. It's not just called wonky photography. Uh, Neil couldn't be bothered to shoot straight. This is a technique that was developed back in the 1920s, 1930s. It is called Dutch tilt. So if anybody says you've got wonky images, say I'm doing Dutch tilt technique, okay? Dutch tilt is about five, 10 degrees either side. I have seen this a few years back in the wedding industry. This was getting silly. They were getting across to 45 degree angles. That was looking a bit odd. Five, 10 degrees either way will add a little bit more dynamic to your image, especially if you've got leading lines in the image as well. Scale. You can either include people in the scale like I did with the tourists there, um, for the icebergs, or you cannot have anybody in the image. You've got no idea how big those icebergs are there or that lava field is because um, you've got no reference point. 
Scale can be really, really useful. Leading lines, have a line coming in from the edge of the frame, left, right, top, bottom. Leading lines also don't have to be straight. They can be curved. Depth of field, use your aperture to control where your viewer's eye is looking, whether that is the foreground, whether it is the background, whether you wanna make something stand out or whether you want to blur the foreground and make somebody look straight to the background. It's entirely up to you but you can use your aperture and where you focus to control where your viewer is looking. Tell a story. Here's a telephone box. Here's inside the telephone box shooting out. Here's the detail on the door handle. Here's the low level shot. Here's it in context of the bike rack and one way street. Tell a story with your photos. Foreground interest, have layers in your picture. That forces your viewer to look through your pictures okay it draws their eye through that automatically okay so if you have layers in your picture foregrounds uh foreground interest you can have foreground and background you can have foreground mid or background gives you a layer to move through okay forces your viewer to look through the picture negative space don't have to always fill the frame with stuff Okay, comes back to simplify your composition. It's very obvious what these pictures are about. Okay, negative space can add a lot to your pictures. Space to move, if you've got moving subjects, give them space to move into. Okay, you've cropped that down the side of the bird in prey there, it's just static in the air. There we can see it's moving. We can see the direction the red arrows are going. We can see how much more that climb has got to do. Um, so give your subjects space to move if they are moving themselves. Symmetry and reflections work beautifully. Okay. These are all just guidelines. If, you, if you're looking at a scene and you can't work out what to do, think about one of these guidelines. Tones, textures, and patterns and color. They can be composition elements in their own right. And if you want, go abstract. That's an iPad with some oil and water over it where the circles are. So that's oil, olive oil sitting on water with an iPad with a sort of wallpaper underneath it. There's a top down shot of a um, flower in the garden. My wife knows what that is. I don't know. It was one of the purple flowers she bought. And then cut somebody's face in half. Who said we need to do that? Um, we can be a bit more abstract with what we're doing. But at the end of the day, if you want to put stuff in the middle, do it. Break the rules. OK, these are your pictures. OK, don't let somebody tell you that your pictures are wrong. They're your pictures. Um, I shoot for me. Um, I don't care whether pictures uh, people like my pictures. If they do. Fantastic. If they don't, that's fantastic as well. They're my pictures. I'm shooting for me. The g stock principles can also help with your composition. Closure, circles, triangles, squares, common regions, group things together, grounding, foregrounds, dark light. Rubin's vase, have you seen that? So the optical illusion where, is it a vase or is it two faces looking at each other? Proximity, how close are subjects in an image? So what are the principles of shooting a good image? The first thing we have to understand is, are we taking a snapshot or are we taking a photograph? There is a place for both. Snapshots tend to be record shots. It's a record of an event. Um, could be a party, could be out and about somewhere where we're, we're, we're going to be a tourist or we're just walking along the street and we want to shoot something. Um, my dog walking down the road or something like that. Um, so it's a record shot and they're fine. But are we creating a photograph? Is it a creative? Are we taking a considered image? Okay. And if we want to improve our photography, we have to shoot with intent. Why are you taking the shot? Okay. What's the brief? What are you giving you? Why, why are you taking that picture? I used to shoot a lot of commercial advertising. I was shooting to an advertising uh, director's brief. Why am I taking the shot? So once I've established why I'm taking the shot, I need to look at the light. That tells me the ISO to set. I need to then determine how much I want sharp. That gives me the aperture I want to set. I then need to set a shutter speed for the motion. So I need to consider my motion blur when holding the camera. And I need to consider my subject's movement. I then need to compose. So I need to frame the image. Okay. I need to consider the colors in it. I need to choose 
whether I'm using a wide angle lens or whether I'm using a telephoto lens. I then need to focus, I then shoot it, and then I finish the image using my editing software. Just quickly, I'm gonna, uh, we've got the settings here, some of my pictures I've shot recently, um, which bring all of this together. So rule of thirds here on this particular image, use of color here, this is sunrise, this is very early in the morning to get a really nice light. That's the same place, but cloudy days. Cloudy days are not bad photography days. They're good photography days. I'm using filters here to blur the motion in the clouds and the water. Reflections. This is Vesterhorn in Iceland. And I went wandering. This is a failed sunrise. It didn't really work out, but the reflection helps make it. The colors help make it. That's it on the day after. The ice is frozen, or the water is frozen there. The black sand has come up through it. And we got brilliant leading lines. I didn't really have to think hard about this shot. It's, it's obvious where the, where, where the leading lines are taking you to. Ice caves are a challenge, but blue against yellow, color wheel theory coming on here, okay? Sunset after a rainy day. Some of the best days you will ever photograph are after sunsets or after rainy days. Shoot to silhouette here to give that very, very nice tone. And we've got layers going on here. Using longer lenses, longer lenses to compress perspective, to pull everything together. If you've actually been here to dark hedges, you'll actually see that these trees are quite far spaced apart. So the longer lens you use, you pull the shot together. Really useful in techniques like this, mountain ranges and portraiture. Sunset, this was unshootable with this level of, without getting sun flare, even three or four years ago. So we can get starburst now with no flare. Similar sort of thing here, foreground interest, layers. Stormy days, so negative space from the house and we've got this big storm coming through Snowdonia. Movement around the iceberg here, snowstorm coming in and sunset. So we've got color and we've got movement going on. Color wheel theory here, shot this last week, I've just come back from Iceland and I just couldn't believe the light on this particular day. It was just incredible. Um, so this is sunset, not the greatest sunset in the world. And we've got separation here with the uh, icebergs. Um, we've got threes, we've got grouping, we've got lots of things going on as well. I'm just using a filter there to blur the, blur the sea away as well. Very simple, it's a telegraph pole. Um, but colors, layers, close up here, stormy days work really, really well as well. Getting yourself low and close, lens choice here, about getting me right in front of the subject. Ice caves again, looking at the patterns and the textures and the tones. Again, this is a failed sunset, uh, but because I've added a layer in the foreground, just in case the sunset failed, and it was now a hike up here, I've still got a good picture. So giving yourself layers in a picture gives you a get out of jail card free. Waterfall, snow, tones, again, movement, normal caves here, with the sharpness we can get on some of the images as well. Astrophotography, we can do this. This is from the North Devon coast. This is the Milky Way from June. Uh, last year, so we can get really amazing images. Cameras perform really well in low light. Aurora, this is Aurora from last week. Um, we can see we can get amazing low light shots as well. The cameras perform really, really well. That's it from me. Hopefully everybody found that interesting. Um, hopefully we've got some questions. Um, let me just stop sharing my screen now and we can go to questions. Well, how, how wonderful those photographs were, Neil. Um, and uh, you, you said you just come back from Iceland, so that must have been um, quite, a, quite a visual treat to, to see all of those things in, in real life. How do, how do you compare your, your photographs with the real life experience? What, is, is this an interpretation or, or is this still, should we still go there? Right, uh, that is a brilliant question, Nigel. Um, I, when I go out shoot, uh, shooting, I have no um, interest in reproducing reality. Um, I don't go to shoot reality. 
um, I produce, uh, one of my clients called it Hyper Real. Um, so my images, they have the colors kick a little bit more, they got a little bit more sharpness in them, but they're not unreal images. Um, so yes, if you go to Iceland, those uh, icebergs are all different colors and they were that blue because um, the age of the ice that was up there. Yes, the sunset was yellow or those pinks and, the, and the, the, the color palette you get to play with over there is completely different to what the color palette we play with in the UK. Um, so I strongly recommend um, going to Iceland if you're a photographer or if you just like seeing uh, amazing spaces. Uh, it's just incredible. But I don't set out to shoot reality as a photographer. I want to make my images just slightly better than reality but it's my way of shooting um other photographer friends of mine uh they'll go and shoot reality i think their pictures look boring they say my pictures look too punchy we agree to disagree <laughs> so out of out of all the there the must be uh tens of thousands of photographs you've taken over the years have you, have you got a favorite photograph uh, is can you can you point to one or is that something that is just uh, impossible um, it, it's really difficult because it changes all the time. The first thing I say to myself after I've taken a picture is how can I improve it? And I've been doing that forever. So up until last week, the reflection shot of that mountain range at Vestrahorn was my favorite. I actually think that iceberg shot with the blue icebergs with the sunset behind it is, well, I think it's pretty much become my favorite picture. And I only shot that last Wednesday um prior to the Vestrahorn image i had an image from snowdonia that i really really liked for years um it evolves i think it's like asking what's your favorite film and then i'll say well what genre are we thinking about yes yes or, or what who's your favorite child uh, parents should yeah, never ask exactly. that question <laughs> <laughs> um i i'm curious because um when, when i when i dabble in photography um Actually, I think more pixels are um, are a hazard to me because uh, it just shows how poor I am at focusing. Um, it, it, is that something that um, is unique to me? I, I suspect not. No, that is very true. When the D800 came out, which was the first 35mm um, camera with 36 megapixels in it, everybody went and bought it because it was the best camera on the market. What the people selling you the camera didn't tell you was once you go above 24 megapixels, it's almost impossible to hand hold that and get a sharp picture unless you're shooting at very, very high shutter speeds, which increases your ISO, which then means your image is softer anyway. So the more megapixels you go to, it does make it harder to shoot sharp images. My 45 megapixel camera rarely comes off my tripod. If I want to shoot handheld, I shoot at my 24 megapixel camera. So you're not unique in that at all. And this is why this quest for more and more megapixels, um, our latest camera that's just come out has not actually increased the megapixel count. Um, lots of people were asking for that megapixel count to go up, um, but they don't realize how difficult it is to shoot high, high megapixel cameras. And then we get diffraction come into it as well. Um, so th there's lots of reasons why we shouldn't go to high megapixel cameras. To be honest, I printed my images four meters by three meters. Uh, that's from a 36 megapixel camera. I don't really need many more megapixels. Hmm. That's and, a really and, uh, good question. Bit, another question that uh, we're, we're going to go over to some more questions from the, uh, uh, the, the audience watching in a moment. But one more from me first. And, um, it, is there a photograph that you wished you'd taken, but the subject disappeared before you could get there? And I, said, um, <laughs> I, I often feel, oh, I just missed those. that one. <laughs> yeah, there's <laughs> lots of those. I, I do, when I'm out doing my landscapes, which is my big passion, um, I, I also do portraiture and wildlife photography. And there are so many missed wildlife shots I've had, which could have been spectacular, but I've normally got my wildlife uh, set up, uh, sorry, my landscape set up when there's, I don't know, red squirrels doing acrobatics on top of dragons and things like this, riding unicorns going past, and I'm just not ready for it. So there's many missed shots. And I think all, all photographers, anybody that says they they don't regret missing a shot is lying, uh, that you always miss shots. Um, and I've missed many, many, many wildlife shots. Um, uh, 
but yeah, it's just one of those things. I just like, um, I'll, I'll get it next time. Or I'm like, it was a landscape day today. I'll, I'll go out tomorrow with my wildlife hat on and then I'll miss some brilliant light on the landscape. It's just one of those things. Is, is there a place there for, for um, just shooting in video and, and taking stills from that? I mean, that, that seems, oh, you've covered all the bases then, haven't you? You have, and now, as the now we've got to 8k and we've got the bsi stack sensors and we can pull off 33 megapixel stills i would agree with you now so there is and that i think will for stills photography is going through an evolution at the moment where um, video has been available to us for many many years but not many people have embraced it um now we get we can pull 33 megapixel stills which is a huge still image um we can actually now blow those up quite big as well. We've got, okay, the dynamic range isn't still quite as good from the video as it would be from, from a, a still image, but we're getting close to that point now where, yeah, video it. Um, but again, we've got to come down to compose it right. It's got to be in the light, right, light, uh, right light as well. So um, there are still some, some considerations. It hasn't made... Uh, videoing everything hasn't made uh, stills photography redundant overnight now 8k is here right, and i think uh, we we saw in the photographs that you uh, you showed at the end of your talk there that there's there's clearly uh, a, a lot of skill involved um and uh, you know that that was that was really a, a revolution to uh, to see that um i'm going to bring in um richard and samantha now and uh, we'll, we'll have a chat um about some of the questions that um the audience have put forward and uh, there's been quite a few questions come in so that's that's really good yeah no thanks uh, nigel and thank you neil for a, for a fascinating presentation that's uh, it i i'm just been thinking to myself i, I wonder where my uh, my dslr is at the moment i may have to dust it off and uh, go and Put, put the camera, put the phone away a little bit and, uh, and start taking some proper photographs again. It's, uh, it's been a fascinating uh, reintroduction to, uh, to the topic. Um, so I'm going to start off with, um, I'm going to lump three, cam uh, three cameras, uh, three questions uh, together, if I may. I've got a couple of people asking about the, what the difference between DSLR and mirrorless is. Uh, and one person um, asking about um, with a DSLR, um, isn't it better to get a view of your subject through actually through a mirror rather than through a pixelated uh, screen view? So, so can you give us sort of an um, introduction to that? Yeah, great questions. Um, so the difference between a DSLR and a mirrorless camera is inside the DSLR, it has the single lens reflect mechanism. Basically, you look at the image through the pentaprism, you look at a mirror and it goes through the lens. In a mirrorless camera, um, the mirror chamber, the mirror box is removed. So what you're looking at is an electronic view viewfinder called an EVF, electronic viewfinder. DSLRs have an OVF, an optical viewfinder, and you're looking at the light that's passing through the uh, lens as it hits the mirror. So that's the big difference. By removing the mirror box out of the mirrorless cameras, we can make them smaller and lighter. We can also enlarge the bayonet mount size that the lens fits onto the front of the, the, the camera body, meaning we don't have to bend the light as much. Okay, so we get sharper images. So mirrorless cameras are generally smaller, lighter, and they have sharper images because the light coming in them isn't as bent as much. Um, especially at the edges. With regard to the OVF, the optical viewfinder versus the electronic viewfinder, that is a bit of personal taste. Now, the very first mirrorless camera I looked at was not a Nikon, and it was one of the very early generation ones. And I hated the electronic viewfinder because it was exactly that. It was looking like a, a pixelated TV. Um, which flickered and didn't have a very good refresh rate. Um, and that was about six, seven years ago. Uh, it was one of the first generation mirrorless cameras. That's why I thought I was going to hate mirrorless when it became really mainstream. As the sensor resolutions, uh, sorry, the uh, EVF resolutions go up, and because we're an optics company, our, our ones have our lens optics behind them and in front of them as well. 
Um, they're very, very bright. I now, as the technologies move forward, I now don't really notice that I'm looking at a screen now. There are also benefits to looking at the EVF because I can now display my images in the viewfinder. I can display my menus in the viewfinder. I can customize all sorts of things in the viewfinder. The camera doesn't have to come off my eye if I don't want it to. Um, I'm not gonna say there's a right or wrong between EVFs and OVFs. Uh, it is very much a personal choice. Um, they're different. Great, thank you very much. Hi, Neil. Um, okay, so this question is um, about dynamic range. Um, so yes. obviously if you have a larger dynamic range, your, your camera allows you to have a larger dynamic range, does that enable you to recover a photographed eye post-processing if it's either underexposed or overexposed? Great question, and that's spot on. Yeah, our eyes roughly see about 24 stops of light, give or take. The best camera on the market, about 14.8, 15 stops of light. So that's still effectively 10 stops of light difference between what a camera can see and what our eyes see. So that's why when you walk into a room, you look at the room, our eyes have got a really wide dynamic range. The shadows on the walls are appear softer. If we were then to take that shot on a camera, you look at it and those shadows are really deep on the camera shot. Now mm. we've all probably seen this. That's because the, the camera's dynamic range, it's not softening those shadows as much because it hasn't got the tonality to do that. However, the bigger the dynamic range on the camera means you can, within reason, in post-processing, recover highlight detail and uncover shadow detail, but it is very dependent on the sensor you are using and the software you're using to do that. Back in the day, we used to underexpose images because it made colors look deeper, colors look richer, and it was safer to do that because you can lift probably on our cameras, so our state-of-the-art cameras, you can lift probably four to five stops under exposure but if you lift an underexposed image, you will add noise to it to a certain degree. From a highlights perspective, so the bright parts of the image, you can probably recover two to three stops. So you haven't got as much tolerance as you had if you, over, um, if you underexposed the image, but sensors do not record light in a linear um, fashion, okay? They record light in a logarithmic fashion. So they record more detail in the highlights. So there is, for certain images, a technique called ETTR, exposed to the right, where you deliberately slightly overexpose your image, so you record more data in it, and you pull it back in post. Now, because you've only got two to three stops overexposure, this is very, very, um, you really have to know what you're doing here. Um, and say if I was shooting a wedding, for example, had a bride in an ivory or a, a white dress, I would not use ETTR because it's very difficult to, well, if you blow the detail on the dress, you're in trouble, okay? Whereas if I'm shooting a landscape with ETTR, that's, and I've got the sky, and I can just pull that back just a bit as well. Um, so yes, you can do that. Um, bigger dynamic range enables you to lift shadows or pull back highlights, but it is sensor dependent. So you talk quite a bit about processing there. Um, how, how much of your um, of your work is shooting with a camera, and how much of it is processing with software afterwards? Um, again, great question. Um, I came from working in a wet dark room, um, so I take my negative, I go into the wet dark room, the light would go on, magic happens, and I come out, and you've got a print. Um, you've got no idea how much work I did on that print. Some prints bit of dodging and burning, light and dark and this, done. Some prints, get the paintbrush out, paint stuff off the negative, um, block this area, paint some other stuff out here. Could be a day doing that. Um, you come out, your hands have gone green, you smell of chemicals. Um, what I do in post now, most of the time is darken the edges, or oh, sorry, um, open up shadow detail, bring back highlight detail, 
make it a bit sharper, kick the colors, add a bit of contrast. So it's basic darkroom technique. I came from the computer industry way back. So I don't dislike playing with computers, but I'd rather be out and about. So I still try and shoot it as close to perfect as I can in camera, but I still do realize I do need to finish my picture like I did in a wet darkroom. So, for example, on, on the, the iceberg one, what did you do to that one? So that one has had the, because I'm shooting into the light, the camera image, the icebergs were slightly darker. I didn't have a flash with me, or I wouldn't have a flash with me to light that amount. So I have to lift the shadow detail a bit there. I have to pull back the highlights in the sky slightly. I then have to kick the colours slightly. I then add a little bit of contrast and a little bit of sharpening to it. That, that's it. Um, if I feel I've got to do more than that, I am probably telling myself I should have done better in camera. <laughs> and, but and, then again, I know, I know lots of digital artists who will replace skies. They'll do wonderful stuff. They have skills in post-processing I can only dream of having, but that's not the way I work. Um, and this is it. You ask 10 photographers for their workflow and how they approach it, you're going to get 15 different answers. And, and the software that you use, is it, is it a, a Nikon software or, or is it? No, I use Capture One, um, which is an independent software company. They make some very high end editing software. I've used Lightroom. I've used Photoshop before. Um, I've used Affinity Photo. Um, we do have our own free software, but it's more of an entry level package to get you into raw processing. Capture One is has been for many years sort of the the high-end um, package. I don't know what they do with their algorithms, but I get better color out of it and I get sharper images out of it. It really suits my style of photography. Certainly for so someone starting out, um, I, I found your, um, your free um, uh, editing software on, on your website. Uh, I'm sure if people are on a shoestring and interested in, in having a go, then uh, that's a good place to start. It is, yeah, very much so. NX Studio is, is, a, is a very good place to get into raw editing because it actually looks like most of the high-end editing software. So if you made a start with that, um, it's a fairly easy transition into one of the other packages if you feel you need to, you need all the sort of features that they offer. Not everybody does need all those, like ability to work with layers and all that sort of stuff. Richard, do you, want, do you want to uh, jump in there? Oh, I think Richard's frozen. It's back to you, Samantha. Right, next question, Neil. Um, this is um, to do with depth of field. Sorry, I'm just trying to bring it up. Wait one minute. So um, in terms of um, depth of field, now that can vary based on the angle of view and also the lens, am I right? So if yes. you used um, a zoom lens and a wide angle, sorry, zoom lens and wide angle, uh, what you, the image, what you see will look different to using a prime lens with the same wide angle. Um, not with a prime, so your focal length, whether it's a prime or whether it's a wide angle, um, so I'm shooting with my 14 mil prime or I'm shooting with my 14 mil, 14 mil zoom, that field of view will be the same because we're at 14 mil. The depth of field will be the same. Right. The, the difference between primes and zooms are historically, primes can, they have less glass in them Therefore, they can go down to lower F numbers, okay? It's very rare to find a zoom lens that goes below F2.8, whereas primes can go down to F0.95, F1.2, because they can be designed that way. It's down to doing lens optics, mm -hmm. okay? The other thing with primes historically is that because they've got less glass in them, the light passes through less glass, therefore you get sharper pictures. With the new mount bayonet mount sizes, um, our 55 mil, it's the biggest mount size on, on the market. Um, our new telephotos, our new zoom lenses are sharper than any of the primes we've ever made before. Um, 
So as technology moves forward, that advantage of having a prime lens um, from a sharpness perspective is pretty much irrelevant now. And that's just because optics has moved forward. What prime lenses do give you is the ability, they really teach you composition because they force you to move your feet, okay? For a zoom lenses make you a bit lazy. Mm. That's a really good question though, but that is one of those things that as technologies move forward, the reason for using primes has become less and less. They are lighter these days than the, the zoom lenses, but from a sharpness perspective, no, very little in between them now and field of view, they're, they're the same. So what type of photography would you use a prime lens for? Um, a prime lens these days, a lot of people use them for street photography because they're smaller and lighter. Um, you could use them for portrait photography or historically they've been used for portrait photography. Um, but again, I, I'd use a, a telephoto these days. Um, so prime lenses, yeah, smaller, lighter is, is where they're really at these days. Um, there's a type of lens called a pancake lens, which is very, very small. So I was chatting with somebody today about those 40 mil F.2, uh, sorry, 40 mil F2 lens. Yeah. Brilliant for wandering around the street with um, and doing portraiture, just everyday photography. So generally you use a prime these days when you want sort of a small lightweight travel kit. Okay. All right, I noticed um, Dennis uh, asking a question about the um, photograph of the aurora that you showed us earlier on. Yep. Did you see the green with your eyes? Is that how it was or is that something that um, only appears when you do a long exposure on the camera? Right. Depends on the strength of the aurora is the honest answer. Your camera will see it way before your eyes do. Um, I'm lucky enough to have seen the aurora many times. so. When you go outside, you start to know what you're looking for. So when you're in a situation like that, or say with the Milky Way, when you go outside, you've got to give yourself 20 to 30 minutes for your eyes to accustom to mm. the sort of darkness around you. If you don't do that, the aurora will appear. Uh, the first time you see the aurora, it will be a gray smudge. Move, it will look like a gray cloud, but moving really erratically or going streaking across the sky in a really sort of bizarre way. As it starts to strengthen, then you will start to see the colors. And as you spent more time outside away from artificial lights, you will start to see the green. Mm. So a couple of things at play there, but on all of those, because I'm in Iceland and we're well away from any light pollution, Yes, you can see it, and it doesn't have to be quite a big storm, um, sort of a geomagnetic storm for you to see it. But your camera will see it way before, will see the green way before your eyes do. That kind of goes on to a question from Ajni who says, um, are you actually able to enjoy the moment while you're chasing some of these shots? <laughs> or is it all about fiddling with the buttons and, look, and looking for what you're going to do next? That is a, um, a that is a brilliant, brilliant observation because that to me is the whole point of being out and about in the landscape or being out in nature. Um, it, uh, photography has sort of brought my, so I, I love hiking. I, I think nothing of walking 10 miles to find a waterfall um, or to go and see if I know uh, if uh, there's ospreys in a lake somewhere or something like that and take my long lens, go and photograph them. Um, so I always make sure I enjoy the moment. And that is so true with the Aurora. You can get so caught up in photographing it. And I say to all the delegates last week, right, stop, cameras off, watch it. And they'll take that in you because you've got to, I do think it's important to savor the moment when you're out there because it is, you can, you're quite right. You can get caught up with the pressing the buttons and things like that. And that takes away from you just looking at it and go, this is amazing. Uh, just to see what nature can do. It always amazes me when you when I see people um, at uh, concerts and so on spending their time creating videos on their phones that they'll never watch rather than enjoying the moment. <laughs> I, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> okay, um, next question, Neil. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to ask because obviously Richard, we've lost Richard, I think, for the moment. Um, it's to do with file format. So you talked about the RAW and the JPEG. 
Um, so one of the questions um, was, you know, in the future, will Nikon support the DNG, uh, the digital negative image format, isn't it? File format. In, um, and also um, you know, some, some of the um, older images obviously were captured um, on slides. So how do we go about converting the old negatives and slides to digital format? Great question. Um, right, let's I'll take the second part of that first. So um, I scanned all my slides. Um, so there's a couple of ways of doing that. Um, we used to make a slide scanner um, way back. You can't get it anymore. Um, I'm talking Windows 3.11 here. So that gives you an idea of how old it was. Um, you can run it under emulation if on modern computers, if you can find an emulator that will run Windows 3.11, but uh, the, the drivers don't work beyond that. So you can scan your slides in, you'll scan them in as high resolution TIFFs. So TIFF is the second highest resolution file format you can get. So scan them in, you'll have to, it's a long process of with a brush, dusting down your, 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 your um, with a fine brush, dusting off your slides, get all the dust off of them and the hairs off of them and things like that, then scan them. If you haven't got a scanner like that, you can get them drum scanned. There are specialist companies that still scan, things like that. I wouldn't necessarily do it on a flatbed scanner. It's not going to give you the highest resolution. Um, but scan them in and then you bring them into your editing software because they're TIFF files. You can now clone out any of the dust and scratches that are still on them. And then you can sort of use it as a digital file now. So I'd get them scanned in. With regard to the DNG format, um, that's Adobe's RAW format. It is just another RAW format. Um, I don't think we'll ever support it because compared with a NEF file, a Nikon electronic file, a DNG file compresses your dynamic range. So um, I don't ever think we will, you'll see that native on the cameras because um, we're, we're compromising the dynamic range our sensors give. So. Um, yeah, I don't see us ever really supporting that in camera. There's no reason why you can't bring the, your NEF files in and then convert them to DNG on your computer as you import them if, you, if you're using the Adobe Suite. Um, but I don't, don't think you'll see it in camera. That said, we don't know what Japan are doing. They might release it on the next camera. So thinking about uh, you know, what we're aiming to do here is, is inspire younger people and um, uh, I, I think it's the photographs that you you showed aren't inspiring then uh, you know that, that's that's uh, uh, something missing there um, but in terms of the technology you, you've shown how to use the very pinnacle of um, uh, of what the state-of-the-art kit can do um, but if you're a young person or if you're looking for a Christmas list what kind of thing would you put on it as a way of getting started how, how much do you need to spend to uh, to get started on the journey that you've you've been on for many years? Um, it depends on really what you want to do. Um, phones up to a point will give you, um, if you've got, got a phone, you've got a good good camera on that, you've got a selection of lenses, you, you don't have the control over light um, as such with being able to control the aperture, shutter speed and ISO as much as we can on the cameras I use, but what you can start teaching yourself is composition. You can also start teaching yourself to look at light. Um, the, the thing about great photos is not, as I started with, cameras manage the light in front of us. Uh, the worst thing you can possibly say to me is, that's a great camera, I bet it takes great pictures. I'll hit you, okay? <laughs> My camera manages light. It's like going up to a carpenter and saying, your hammer is amazingly talented. Look at the staircase it built. Yeah. So the, it's the six to 12 inches behind the camera is where the talent is. And a lot of our ambassadors and creators, they understand composition, light. They understand about the 30% that makes their camera go, okay, to shoot the genre they need. So understand composition, understand light. Start with a secondhand camera if you want. Start with your phone. And as you start getting into this, then yeah, start to get a camera. If you're just looking for a camera that has a manual mode on it, aperture priority mode or shutter priority mode, um, that's good. Start. And even our entry level cameras have those. Uh, and get a kit lens and then start from there. 
and then you, it's you can build slowly as you go you do not need state-of-the-art kit i didn't start with state-of-the-art kit years back i started with a second-hand film camera and one lens and started to learn about light and composition and, and, and it was your dad that uh, that got you into this yeah, in my family, you either did fishing or you did photography. I tried fishing and I'm patient. I'm very, very patient, but I'm not patient enough to do fishing. So I ended up in the photography camp. You need, yeah, you need some patience still for photography as well, don't you? <laughs> you do, which is why my wife doesn't do landscape photography. She is a very good portrait photographer, um, wedding photographer. She loves directing people. She cannot stand to be with me when I'm waiting for the light to change on the land or the clouds to move in a certain direction. She can't direct the clouds or the light. So, um, yeah, she doesn't do landscape photography with me. OK, um, one, I think one time for one final question, I think, yeah. Neil, um, and again, linked with, you know, people who want to get into photography. What do you think are the most sort of difficult photography techniques that we should we need to master to get that good photograph? Um, the most difficult um, thing to my, so, and this is an ongoing thing, um, I'm still, I've been doing this a long time, I'm still learning about light and composition. So I said, my first thing when I shoot a picture, how can I improve it? Okay, and there's always a way I can improve it. I could have changed the angle or I could use light better and things like that. Um, so the, the most difficult technique to master or the most challenging ones are probably low light photography. Okay. And that comes down to actually having the right kit because kit is designed to work in certain environments. Okay. And a lot of people push their equipment beyond the, the basically operating environment that they're, they're, they're trying to use it in and they get disappointing results. Um, in actual fact, the kit wasn't designed to do that anyway. Um, so low light photography can be challenging, but actually it's quite easy um, if you have the right kit. Um, so um, yeah, it's just making sure you've got the right kit for the job you do. Any shot can be taken and I could shoot any shot with a camera from 10 years ago. The newer cameras just make my life a lot, lot easier. And, and of course, compared with, um, with your trusty role of film, um, you don't have to think about whether to press the button or not. You just press it anyway. Yeah, I, I, that is a really good point. One of the, um, back in the day, that was a very, very conscious decision. I, that's why I talk about the brief. Why am I pressing this button? When I teach wedding photography now, uh, if we go back 15 years ago, um, no, actually, I'm kidding myself here, 20 years ago, um, I was still shooting weddings on film. And now I had 10 rolls of 36 exposure, so that's 360 pictures for the entire day. Between me and the lab, I'm gonna ruin eight of those. 280 pictures a day to shoot an entire wedding. And every time I press the shutter button, that's two pound development cost. Um, so that really focuses your mind as to what you're taking. These days, just because I can shoot four billion pictures, doesn't mean I should. I've, I've had the craft of shooting a film camera, so I'm not quite as trigger happy as some of my <laughs> photographer friends um, because they, yeah, uh, the, the new Z9 uh, will shoot um, a thousand images in a, well, about, ooh, what were we doing? We were doing that in about 30, 40 seconds. Uh, you still got to look through them <laughs> uh, after you've taken that many um it's it's uh yeah uh, i think shooting a film camera gives you a bit of a discipline um which is is not bad to have or say to yourself okay i know it doesn't but every time i press this button that's two pound um that that certainly focuses your mind on still why you're taking certain pictures brilliant um i, th I think we've uh, we've covered pretty much the questions from the audience so that's uh, that's that's really good and thank you very much for samantha for uh, helping me out with that <coughs> um we're pretty much uh, coming to the the end now and uh it's been a fascinating talk that you've given us and and also giving us a, a look into the way you think about photography and the the, the way that um, beyond the technology, you use the creativity to make wonderful images. And uh, uh, thank you again for sharing a lot of those 
with us today. If people are interested to to see more, um, they can find you on Instagram as your your main um, uh, place where you where you put your photographs. Um, and of course, yes, anyone is. who's interested um, can look up the Nikon School and uh, some of the other work that uh, that Neil is doing. So with that, I, I would like, to, <coughs> excuse me, to um, give a hearty thanks from all those that are watching. And more importantly, if if you're slightly older, don't forget your mission. Having watched the um, the event today, is to find someone who's a lot long, younger than you and show them this video on YouTube when, uh, when it's up um, in a few days time. And that will be uh, our mission to get more people into photography, more people into technology, because the amount of photography that the world needs continues to explode. So this is definitely a space where there's plenty of room for everyone. Um, and with that, uh, I'd like to bring the proceedings today to an end and uh, do watch, look out for our other videos on YouTube and uh, come back and see us again in January when we'll have another exciting webinar, uh, which we would love you to attend. Thank you very much. <laughs>